Hello everyone, it's Mr. N here again, and uh, today we're going to be doing this Chapter 4, Test 2, Review 2. So this is the one you were given in class, and we're going to go ahead and walk through this one. Alright, so on this first question it says, suppose you have the graph of f prime of x to b, or suppose you have the graph of f prime of x, and we're looking at this, and we want to know where f of x, the original right here, is increasing and concave down. So again, remember that we are looking at a derivative graph. So for it to be increasing, we want f prime, for this part, we want f prime to be above the axes because I'm looking for f prime to be greater than zero. For the concave down, we look at the second derivative and I want f prime to be negative, so I'm looking for f prime to f double prime to be less than zero. So, in other words, over here, since I'm given a derivative graph, I'm looking for slopes here, and I'm looking for above or below the axes on the increasing decreasing part. So let's take a look at what we have here. On <clears throat> this, if I break this up into a number line, and I I always like you guys to do it as a number line. We'll do this one here. This is at negative one. We'll put in some of our critical points here. We'll just, actually, we'll just do the whole thing. This is at zero. Here's at one, two, three, and four. So over here, this is going to be my f prime. And at one, at negative one, I'm going to put a little dashed line here. We've got Everything on this graph is going to be above the axes. So this is a derivative graph, so right here above the axes. So I'm going to put positives right in here. Okay, between, between 0, or between negative 1 and 3, so that's 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, right here, I have everything on this derivative graph as being below the axes, right there. So these are all going to end up being negatives, all the way out to the 3. And then at 3, again, we switch and we go above the axes, so these will be positives. And then this is 4, and at 5, we switch again and go negative. Let me extend this out just a teeny bit. So we will just kind of go like this. And at 5, I switch and then I go <coughs> negative again. We could do the same thing for the second derivative, and I'll do that right underneath in a different color. And for the second derivative, we are looking at slopes. And in this case, the slopes change at 1. So these are all negative slopes right in here, and then they change at 1 to become positive. So at 1 right here, we have a change. So I'm going to just kind of dash this along for you here. I'm going to put a little dash. So we know we've got a couple borders here that we're looking at. And then again, it changes, the slopes end up changing to be positive, right? All the way up to this point here where they again change to be negative. So, and that point occurs at 1, 2, 3, 4. So the slopes again change to be at 4 right there. So let's go ahead and put another little border here. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's going to allow me to compare where f prime is greater than 0 and f double prime is less than 0 all in one graph. So I could take a look, by all means, you can take a look at this and determine that from here, but I'm just showing you a way to break it down so that's a little bit more visual for you to see. Over here I have all negatives because these slopes are negative. Over here we said these slopes are all positives between 1 and 4, and then we're back to negative. So now I'm looking for the situation where I've got the derivative to be less than 0, but then the second derivative to be greater than 0. So here's the derivative, less than 0, and then I want <coughs> the 
second derivative to be less than zero. So first derivative greater than zero right here, less than zero. It happens on this interval from negative infinity to negative one. These are both negatives, nothing in there. Then again, it happens on this interval from So we're looking again on this tiny interval that I have right here. This is, this is where f prime is greater than zero, f double prime will be less than zero. So let's write down these intervals. So the first one we said is going to be from negative infinity to negative one. So from negative infinity to negative one, then again I'm looking for positives and negatives. The next one is going to end up being, these are positives, positives we said from four to five because at five it goes below the axis, anything past that, so I'm not going to use. So from 4 to 5. So we will union this with the interval from 4 to 5. So that's our answer for part A. Alright, now for part B, we are taking a look and we want f of x to be increasing at an increasing rate. So f of x increasing means f prime is greater than zero. Increasing rate, we're looking at the second derivative to also be greater than zero. So I'll take a look at the graph I have drawn, and I'm looking for at when will both of these be positive. So looking in this region right in here between three and four, let me draw it out. If I can break it apart for you, between three and four, notice I've got positive values here and I've got positive values there. So where is f of x increasing at an increasing rate? This will just happen in this one region which is between 3 and 4. Alright, moving on to number 2. For number 2, it says given the following tables for t in seconds and v of t in meters per second, we want to estimate a of 5. Alright, well we know that if I take a derivative of velocity, I get an acceleration. So in this case, we're asked to give an estimate for that instantaneous velocity, the instantaneous velocity at 5, which is the acceleration at 5. But from my table here, I have to find an average over that interval. So I can choose to do this between 5 and 2 or 5 and 7. It doesn't really matter um, at this point. And the reason being for that, again, is I'm given a table. So from the table, I can only get that average, and I'm looking for an instantaneous. So you have to take it over the interval. You would have to get it as close to that 5 as possible. So there are two scenarios where this can happen. We could use the 7 and the 5 or the 2 and the 5. So if I use the 2 and the 5, I would set this up as being 5 minus 2 over 6 minus 4, which is the change in velocity over the change in time. And in this case, I'll get 3 over 2. Or you could have done it from 7 minus 5 oops, uh, over 8 minus 6 from this interval right in here to get 2 over 2, which is 1. So either one of these answers will work. On the AP test, they would take either one as well. All right, let's move on to number 3. It says... Given the following line graph for f prime of x. So we have a line graph here, and in this line graph, this is for f prime of x. So let's indicate that this is f prime of x. And we're asked some questions here. Take a look at what's happening before we even look at it. We see that the derivative is positive, so that means I have positive slopes to a negative slope. Hmm, what does that give me there? Over here, I've got negative slopes to a positive slope. So this could be a positive relative maximum, this would be a relative minimum over here. Alright, let's answer. So critical points. Critical points are where it's zero or undefined, and we can tell by this f prime of x, these are going to occur at these values right here. So this is at, at x equals 5, 2, and 7 is where this occurs. Where are the relative maximum and minimums? Well, we just talked about that. So we've got a relative maximum at x equals negative 5 and a relative minimum at x equals 7 and the justification is we have a change in slope and a change in slope if we're going positive to negative that gives us a relative maximum 
If we're going from negative to positive, that would yield a relative minimum, these changes in slope. So we can justify it with that reasoning. <clears throat> okay, now we need to determine where f of x is increasing and decreasing. And again, we have to justify our reasoning. Well, it's increasing when increasing when f prime of x is greater than 0. And we know that we can look at our line graph, and we know that this occurs at negative infinity to negative 5, and we're going to union that with 7 to infinity. And decreasing, we know from decreasing that we need f prime of x to be less than 0, and again, we can take a look at our graph here, and this occurs on the interval from negative 5 to 2, and then we're going to union that from 2 to 7. Notice I did not include the point at 2, because at this spot right here, I don't know if it's increasing or decreasing, because that's a critical point. So it's neither decreasing nor decreasing, so we're just going to leave these intervals, my increasing and decreasing intervals. All right, moving on. Number four, given the following equation, find all relative extrema. So let's go ahead and first find, take our steps that we work on this and find the derivative. So we've got f prime of x being 3x squared minus 12x plus the 12. We can set this equal to 0 to find our critical points, and we'll take out a 3, and then we can factor this into x minus 2 times x minus 2, so it's x minus 2 squared. So this occurs at x equals 2 is my critical point. Again, it's where <clears throat> it'll be 0 or undefined. If I go ahead and start putting this on a number line, here's 2, I will realize that I will get positive values here and positive values there. So let's take this. This is my f prime. Let's take the second derivative. And the second derivative yields 6x minus 12. If I set this equal to 0, it will, or undefined, it will yield my possible inflection points. So I get x equals 2 as a possible inflection point, and I need to test this. So let's put in 2, and this is into the second derivative, and I get negatives here, and I get positive there. Yep, it is an inflection point. So find all relative extrema. In this case, Taking a look at f prime, it doesn't change in slope, so we have no relative maximum or minimum. Find all points of inflection. We just went ahead and did that with the second derivative. This occurs at x equals 2. Find all values of c that are guaranteed by mvt on, zero, on the interval from 0 to 4. So, mvt. Remember, there's three parts to it. Part one, is it continuous? Yes. Part two, is it differentiable? Yes. We've taken the derivative of it. So then what we can say now is we can say f of b minus f of a over b minus a equals f prime of c. So in this case, the slope of the tangent is going to be the same as the secant. So let's go ahead and put in the values we have here. So this is going to be f of 4 minus f of 0 over 4 minus 0 equals f prime of c. Well, I took the derivative. Now we're going to put c into there. So we get 3c squared minus the 12c plus the 12. I will get, <clears throat> at this point, I will clean this up, plug in f of 4, plug in f of 0, and I end up with 4 equaling 3c squared minus 12c plus 12. So I get 0 equals 3c squared minus the 12c plus 8. And at this point, we're going to need to use the quadratic formula. And when we do the quadratic formula, we get two values of c. We get c equals 3.155 and 0.845. So these are my two values of c guaranteed by MVT. If you graph this out, you would obtain from 0 to 4, you would obtain a graph that looks something like this. And so what we are doing is here is our secant.
and then here are two tangents in which they are parallel to that secant line. So that's graphically what's happening on this problem right here. All right, let's move on to number five. In number five, it says, use the table below to sketch a graph of the function f of x. Now, again, these, when you're given tables like this, the answers can vary. And we're going to just come up with a possible sketch based on what we're given. Um, what's a good idea first is to put in points you know. So let's look at x and f of x. So in this case, I know that I have a point at negative 2, 0. So I'm going to put in that point. At negative 2, 0, we'll put in a value there. I know I have a point at 0, 0. We'll put a value there. And then I know I have a point at 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So now I, I do know that I have a point here at 4, 6. Now, that kind of gives us a starting spot. So now let's go ahead and see what we can determine. All right, so on the interval from negative 2 to infinity, the derivative is positive and the second derivative is positive, which means that this is increasing and it's concave up. So then we have this point here. Then from negative 2 to 1, it's still increasing and concave up. So from negative 2 to 1, increasing concave up at negative 1, it doesn't exist. So we can, at this point, at negative 1, just put a dashed line because we know that that f does not exist, so I'm not going to have any value there. And again, concave up right here, increasing, concave up, increasing. So we can go ahead and draw a curve that's concave up and increasing like that all the way through that goes through the point negative 2, 0. All right, let's look at the next set of intervals. Over here, if I'm looking at negative 1, to 2, so negative 1 to 2, right to there, it's increasing but concave down. So it looks like it's going to come from this asymptote right here and kind of go like that. So that's one possible scenario I can draw. So I'll go ahead and do that. And it's going towards this value, but then look, it goes through 0, 0, and then from 2 to 4, it changes concavity, goes back to concave up. So it looks like it goes like this and back up towards this point. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch that. I'm going to go up and then here it changes concavity and goes up towards that point like that. So that's kind of one possible scenario here. The derivative doesn't exist at 4. So that means it looks like there's a kink, there's a hole, there's something that happens at here. But then we continue concave up and increasing. So I'm just going to make it a kink. And I'm just going to go like this. Obviously, you can do more than that. It doesn't matter. You have other possible options. But I'll just go ahead and make it a kink in the graph. We'll draw it like this. And that's one possible scenario for this sketch. All right, so let's move on to the next problem. Over here we have number six. Suppose you have 80 feet of linear fencing to enclose a rectangular space for a garden. Find the largest possible area that can be enclosed with this much fencing. What are the dimensions that yield this area? So this is a basic optimization. It's a pretty simple optimization problem. So I've got a rectangular area here. We know the perimeter is 80. This is our length and our width. Um, since all these sides are enclosed and I'm using every side, we're going to end up with a square. Now, if I was not using one of the sides, so often you'll get a problem where this is up against a river, uh, up against a barn, so you only use three of the sides. In that case, it won't be a square and you will end up with a rectangle, rectangular uh, space. So over here, we're going to say the area is the length times the width. This is all the stuff that we are given in our problem. We know that the perimeter is twice the length and twice the width. We know this equals 80. At this point, if I try to take the derivative of the area, I have two variables. So I want to try to simplify this down into a one variable equation before I try to optimize it. So we're going to take this perimeter and solve for either L or W. It doesn't matter. I'll go ahead and solve for L. I can first start by dividing everything by 2. So I end up with L plus W equals 80. So in this case, I will have L or equals 40, sorry. Let's correct that. Equals 40 because I divided everything by 2. So L will equal 40 minus W. So the area 
ends up being 40 minus W times the W. And let's put this up here. The area is 40W minus W squared. And let's find a feasible domain before I optimize this. So that means W is going to end up being from 0 to, and in this case I want to see where I would get a negative here, and I can make W all the way up to 40. So these are the two areas I want to test because I want an absolute maximum, so I have to test the endpoints of my domain. So at this point, we can continue on taking the derivative. So I end up with 40 minus 2w. Set this equal to 0 to get our critical points. So I end up with w equals 20 as our critical point. So this, is, this could be a relative maximum. So um, we want to go ahead and test it. And we do see a change from at 20 here, if you test it in your <coughs> a prime, we see a change in slopes from positive to negative, so we do have a maximum. Okay, so we tested it into a prime. All right, so now at this point, we know we want to finally determine what is our absolute. So we know we have a relative here, and will this be an absolute? So we need to test a of 0, a of 20, and a of 40. So we test the endpoints of our domain along with our critical point. Here we're going to get 0, here we get 400, and here we get 0. So yes, this is an absolute maximum. So we end up with a maximum area of 20 by 20, which will yield 400 square units. So these are the dimensions that yield the maximum area. Okay, moving on to the next problem. We have squares of equal size that are cut out of a 20 by 24 rectangle. And, oops, on this, I just realized something on this last one. It's not square units. This is going to be square, or square feet, because we say linear feet there. All right, so back to number seven. Okay, so we are given um, squares of equal size that are cut out of a 20 by 24 rectangle and folded up to form a box with an open top. What are the dimensions of the squares to form the largest possible volume? All right, so let's go ahead and move this up. I'm going to need quite a bit of room on this one, I believe. So basically what we are given here is we are given this situation where I have X is cut out of this box, and I'm going to cut an X here and an X there, and then when you fold it up, you will end up with the X being right there, and this will be an open top box right here. So it'll be open. So when you fold these edges up, that's what you'll end up with. And it says that it's 20 by 24, so this is 20 minus the 2x. Again, we subtract x because we have an x on this side and an x on that side. So this ends up being 20 minus 2x, and that whole length when we, when we work it out. And this will be 24 minus the 2x on that end, because all the way across is actually actually this should be all the way across is 20 all the way up is 24 so right there but then when we fold it up we're taking an x away from each side so we are given a volume which is going to be x times the 20 minus 2x times the 24 minus 2x and this is what we want to maximize in this case but before we even do that let's look at what our domain would be so those are all our givens. Let's look at our domain. Our domain will be from x equaling 0 all the way out to, well, here it could be 10, here it could be 12. I need to choose a smaller one so I don't end up with a negative volume. So in this case, we're going to choose it to be 10. So we have to test whatever critical values we get and the endpoints of the domain to find the absolute. So the volume here ends up being... Well, let's go ahead and take the derivative of this. Uh, we have the volume equation, so we're going to find the derivative. And taking this, there's different ways I could do it. I'll go ahead and at this point, before I take the derivative, let's go ahead and distribute um, this and write this as v equals 20x minus 2x squared. And I'll just use the product rule on this one. You could have just foiled the whole thing out and just gone from there, but I'll just go ahead and choose to do it this way. So over here, if I take the derivative, 
um, I get V prime equaling this first, which is the 20x minus 2x squared times the derivative of the second, which will be negative 2, plus the second, which is 24 minus 2x times the derivative of the first. Derivative of that first one will be 20 uh, minus 4x. Okay. Working this out and cleaning all this up. So let's come let's foil things out, combine like terms. Looks like you end up having to foil out anyway. So in this case, we're going to end up with negative 40x plus 4x squared um, plus the 480 minus the 96x minus the 40x plus 8x squared. All right, go ahead and combine like terms at this point, clean this whole thing up. And you will end up with v prime equaling 12x squared minus 176x plus 480. And let's set that equal to 0 to find our critical points. At this point, you can't factor this, so let's go ahead and use a quadratic formula. And we're going to end up with x being... 3.6214 and 11.045. I'm going to throw this one out because it's not in the domain. So now we need to test okay, to see if this is a maximum. And I will tell you that this does come up to be a relative maximum when you test it. And you can test it by plugging it back into that first derivative, seeing where it increases plug values less than it and greater than it. Um, and now we have to test that along with the endpoints to see which is the absolute. So I'm going to test V of 0, V of 3.6214, and V of 10. Well, V of 0 comes out to be 0, V of 10 comes out to be 0, and then this one comes out to be 774.16 cubic units. So our answer ends up being the dimensions, which is what we're looking for, uh, which is the x is going to be 3.6214, and then we could plug it in and find the other two sides, and they'll come out to be 12.7518 by 16.757. So those end up being the dimensions of this box. Okay, so now we're moving on to the last problem. And on this one, we have to find the antiderivative of each of these. So for this first one, we're taking a look at this. And again, we said antiderivative is the same as the integral. So that's really what we're doing here. And over here, we have f of x. And over here, this ends up being as x to the fourth. Because when we take the antiderivative, the power goes up by 1. And then we can guess and check. So 4 times, if I took the derivative here, 4 times what number would yield a 2? And that would have to be 1 half. And then we apply the same process throughout. So this would be x to the third. And I would need 5 thirds. Over here, this would be x squared. And I would need 3 over 2. And then on this last one right here, it would be 2x and then plus c. So this would be the antiderivative of part a. For part b, we follow the same process again. So we have f of x. And in this case, what, would, what derivative would give us the cosine x? And that would be the sine x. So again, we're looking at what derivative yields that. The sine of x would yield the cosine of x minus, over here, what derivative would give me a secant squared, and that would be tangent. But remember, I've got a constant right there, so I need to include that in there because when I take the derivative of 2 tangent x, I'll end up with 2 secant squared x. And then plus our final constant in the end, plus c. So there is the antiderivative for that. So hopefully this review helped, and uh, good luck studying for your test.